that our last reading is from Revelation, from the 19th chapter. I'll read verses 19 through, oh gosh, what did I say? Did I say 18? Or I say 21. I said 21, didn't I? If I said 21, I really should read all the way through 21. That's what I'll do. Uh, Revelation 19, uh, that's on page 1889 in the large print Bible and 1251 in the smaller print Bible. John writes this, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dripped in blood, or dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can tell all your friends that last week the pastor preached on Song of Solomon, this week on Revelation the two most tortured books in the Bible in terms of interpretation. Once upon a time, there was a great king, powerful and wise, and the king provided for all of his people all that they needed and much more, poured out blessings upon them, much more than just their mere requirements, but more than that, they had all that they could ever want. When there were threats and there were danger, the king protected his people and the king fought battles and vanquished their foes. The king was so powerful that the people oftentimes didn't even see how he was able to win these battles. They didn't necessarily see him at work in these ways. They didn't see how the king provided for them. So some of the people said, well, we can do this ourselves. Everything we need is right at hand. All we have to do is gather it in. And these battles don't seem to be so difficult to win. We go out to war and then we win. We can probably, not, we can probably do this on our own. We probably don't need a king for all of that. Some even said, I don't think there really is a king at all. I don't think anyone's ever seen him, not in a long time anyway. Maybe there's not a king. Maybe it's all about us. We can do it all ourselves. And the people turned away. And they defied their king and they rebelled against their king and they ignored their king and they forgot their king. Once upon a time, there was a great king, powerful and wise, and the king loved his people and he served them. He took care of their needs. He had power to cure them of all their diseases. He told them everything that they needed to know. He did not wear royal robes, or he didn't ride around in grand chariots or carriages. He didn't have heralds walking ahead of him with trumpets blowing, announcing his coming. Or if he did, people got used to it and ignored them as well. He healed He was powerful, more powerful than all the evil creatures that threatened them, so much more powerful that the people felt no threats. He talked a lot. He told them a lot of things. And the people said, well, he doesn't look much like a king. He doesn't act like a king. He's more of a talker, more of a healer. And that's not the kind of king that we want. That's not what we look for in a king. What kind of king do the people want? What kind of king do the people look for? This summer we've looked at several kings. King Saul, who was a head taller than everybody else. He was handsome. He was strong. He was victorious. He was also an idolater. He was also greedy and ambitious. Eventually, awfully paranoid as well, and tried to kill the one whom the Lord had chosen to succeed him. We looked at King David, who was not a head taller than everybody else, Uh, in fact, was youngest of all of his family, therefore not the one you would expect to become a king. But he also was handsome. He was victorious, even more victorious than Saul was. 
also had his struggles, particularly with Bathsheba. We looked at King Solomon, young like his father, wise, wealthy, thought to ask for the right thing instead of ask for everything and got everything in return. And in return, he also, like his father, was an adulterer and like two kings before him, Saul was an idolater. What kind of king do the people want? The tragedy of looking at these stories of Saul and David and Solomon is that the people already had a king. They had a king and their God. Their God and king was with them, served them, protected them, fought their battles for them, and they turned away. No, we want a king like everybody else. We don't want this king we can't really see. We don't want a king that doesn't walk among us. And this is this horrible tragedy because the very presence of God was made manifest to them in when they're coming out of, the, out of Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land. Of course, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. When they built the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord filled the holy of holies and the priests couldn't finish what they were doing just as later at the temple. The very presence of God was there. They had a king who walked with them, who did fight their battles. Every time the people tried to take it upon themselves to fight their battles or solve their problems, they found that they were not up to it. But when they allowed God to fight the battles for them, then suddenly everything was taken care of. The Lord himself won the victory. The Lord himself provided manna from heaven and quail, water from the rock. And we want a king like everybody else. It's not really a tale of two kings. That's the title of the sermon. It's, of course, not true at all. It's really the tale of one king who turns out to be the king of kings and lord of lords. But this is the strange path the story takes. The sort of king you think you would want, all glorious and majestic, impressive in power, wise beyond our ways, who knows everything, who can do everything, that's the king the people had. Oh, we don't really like him so much. We, we need a different king. Somebody else. We want a king of flesh and blood who can walk among us. We can talk to him and we can do what he says and he can hear from us. And they got that with Saul. They got that with David and they had generations of warfare. They got that with Solomon and finally there was peace, but a strange peace. And then as soon as Solomon died, I spared you this this summer. I spared you Solomon's son telling the people... You know, my father was hard on you, but you haven't seen hard yet. He worked you hard. I'm going to work you ten times harder. That's because when he sought the counsel of the elders, and in this case, elders, both in terms of position as well as age, they said, oh, no, no, here's the thing. The people will love you forever if you will just take care of them. And then he turned to all his friends, the ones his age, and they said, oh, no, you want to impress them. You want to be a real king. Tell them you're going to work them even harder. And in the end, the kingdom splits in two, and disaster after disaster follows. People wanted a king of blood and flesh, flesh and blood, to walk among them, to talk to them. Well, they got that too. It's part of the tragedy of reading that story. And it was a lot for Dale to read, right, that story in John. But what I wanted you to hear over and over was this conversation about kings. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, my kingdom is not from here. It's from another place. So you are a king. Pilate isn't necessarily concerned that this is a more powerful king than Caesar, whom he serves. But all this back and forth about a king, Jesus doesn't look very kingly. He's been brought before Pilate before the break of day. Uh, He has already been beaten upon, spit upon, and then turned over to the Roman soldiers who do a lot worse. Before that final last verse, Pilate handed handed him over to them to be crucified. That doesn't look much like a king. Jesus is a lot like that second king, who was the same king as the first, by the way. The one who healed, the one who served, the one who didn't wear royal robes. The only time Jesus wore royal robes was when the soldiers had dressed him in purple and put a crown of thorns upon his head after flogging him. He didn't look like much much like a king then either. What do we want in a king? We don't know what we want. That's the big problem with us. We think we might have some idea of what would be good for us. We think we might have some idea of, well, if the things were like this, then I could live in a certain way. Then I could be obedient to God. Then I could trust in God. Then I could pray boldly and live with love if things were this way or that. If only God would show up in this particular way or that particular way. They had the one and only true God in the whole universe, the people rebelled. When the word became flesh and dwelled, tabernacled, pitched his tent among them, the people conspired to kill him. It's a pretty amazing image here at the end of Revelation. Heaven stands open. 
For some reason, you've heard this a lot from me. I don't know why it is really stuck in my head. I mean, it's a profound thought. That's probably why. But something that I can't quite get over is, and it's really been from Easter and all the way through this summer, very clear on what, what, and what happens on the cross, even though it's a mystery, of course, right? God himself, the only begotten Son of God, second person of the Trinity, comes down, is fully divine, fully God, and also fully human, and takes our sins upon himself on the cross. And that is an amazing exchange that I don't entirely understand, but I know what's supposed to be happening there. We have forgiveness of sins by Jesus' death on the cross. Great. It's something about this Easter, though. Something about not only the tomb being open and Jesus raised from the dead, but this thing that keeps sticking in my head, it mostly comes up in uh, the prayers of the people when you'll hear it from me. But this idea that the gates of heaven were flung wide. Jesus has conquered sin and death. Gates of heaven are open, and now you can come in. Wide open. I saw heaven standing open. Heaven is closed to us normally, right? We can't get there. How are we going to get there? How will we know it if we get there? We can't get in there. And that is true. And these bodies that we have now and the state that we're in now, we're not able just like this to go straight to heaven without some serious divine intervention. Elijah pulled it off amazingly. But no, heaven is standing wide open. And then an image of Jesus unlike any other in the entire Bible Jesus on a white horse with a whole army on white horses. And this is the Lord of hosts. This is the army that oh, mighty fort- a mighty fortress is our God, that Lord Sabaoth, that's Lord of hosts, commander of the army of heaven. And his eyes are blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns, and the armies of heaven follow him, and it is a sight to behold. Some things that John saw in this revelation, he said, I can't, sorry, I can't write that down for you. Even this, the angel said, no, you can't tell them that. They're going to have to wait for that. Some things uh, we just can't know. But this he's allowed to tell us. The commander of the armies of heaven coming out against the greatest threat against the people of God and against God's green earth that has ever been seen. And he comes out and he has these names that only he knows and he has names called faithful and true. And he's the word of God. And on his robe and on his thigh is this written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is another amazing image, and it's really a tale of the first king, who, like I said, was the second king as one king all along. It's the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in this case, all the armies line up for battle, and you think this is going to be the worst thing we've ever seen. It's going to be cataclysmic. It's going to be death and destruction, whatever is going to happen. And will, in the end, God be able to win out over evil and death and the power of sin and Satan, the beast This is not the scene that necessarily people who make movies in Hollywood would want to do out of Revelation. I mean, the lead up is great. The suspense is killing us, right? All these armies of heaven pouring out and out before them are all the dark armies of the beast and the false prophet and what's going to happen now. And they line up and you've seen all kinds of uh, battle movies and war movies. And some of the more recent ones that my family ends up watching have to do with uh, hobbits and orcs and elves and dwarves. But this is it. The battle lines are drawn and it looks bad. The army of heaven is so impressive, but the army of the beast looks awfully scary. But this is why you can't make a movie out of this one, because they line up for battle, they line up for war, they gather together to wage war against the rider on on the horse and his army, but the beast was captured and it was over. If ever you wonder if the people are right who say that all of philosophy and all of history is good versus evil and basically they're pretty well balanced and we hope that the good will win out and that's what Christians believe that in the end good will win out and but it's going to be a close thing and there's so much evil in this world and it's got so much power and it does in so many horrible ways. But if ever if you're in any doubt that it's going to be a close call, if you're ever in any doubt that God may not in the end be able to do what he tells us he's going to do, Remember this, the army of the beast lines up thinking this is it. And if we win now, we win everything. And it looks like they don't even get to fight. Jesus shows up and says, well, it's over. The beast is captured. Now, maybe it's just an anticlimactic way of writing about an incredible battle. Maybe a lot happened and people died and then finally they got to the beast. But it sounds a lot like Jesus said, I am 
and I am here, and it is finished. This is not at all what I thought I was going to talk about, but it may be the most important thing that we have to hear, that evil does not win, that all the tragedy that we have seen in this world and in our lives and in other people's lives and throughout history, it doesn't win. Sin has power to trip us up and scare us and hurt us. And death is scary because we don't exactly know what it's going to be like. And because this God who says, I'm going to grab you and I'm going to catch you and I'm going to hold you, seems sometimes to be far away and not really visible. But this is the thing. All the forces of evil, everything opposed to God, lines up for battle and God says, glad you're here. It's over. And Jesus wins. I read a pretty horrific image there, right? The angel crying out to all the birds. And these are not the sweet, cute little birds that fly around that are so beautiful. These are not the fall migration birds. Uh, These are vultures and birds of prey and things that eat dying things, ravens and crows. Those are the sorts of birds that used to gather around battles. And the angel declares, come gather together for the great supper of God. And all the forces opposed to God will be this great supper. This is a strange juxtaposition of two really important ideas. The Supper of God and the Wedding Feast of the Lamb in the same book within a couple of chapters set right right next to each other and because of the same thing. The Supper of God where all the vultures and ravens and crows come down to feed on the generals and uh, the beast and all those opposed to God is also what leads us, well, what leads us to this table and what leads us to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Christ has conquered. Christ the victor. Christus victor. Uh, That great line through the generations of the church. Because this, this strange little meal that we are about to partake of, this strange thing, I'm going to break a loaf of bread, but I'm going to proclaim that the body of Christ has been broken for us. I'm going to pour some grape juice into a cup, and I'm going to say that Jesus said this cup is the new covenant in my blood, blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This is the declaration that it has been won. The King of kings and Lord of lords has conquered, not just one day down the road, but now all the power of the universe is at our disposal. And that's not even the way I want to say it. I want to say that so you know this is a powerful thing when God says, ask and I will give it to you. Seek and you will find. When God says, I will take care of you and it's not going to look like it sometimes and you're going to pass through raging waters and you're going to be scared you're going to drown and you're going to go through the flames and you're scared you're going to be burned up, but I will protect you even through that in ways that you won't know at the time and maybe won't know until eternity. All that leads us to this strange little meal, a tiny piece of bread and a tiny, tiny sip of grape juice, which is a foretaste, not of the supper of God with the birds of the air feeding on the flesh of kings and generals and mighty, but the wedding feast of the lamb, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ himself, the bride, the church coming together, proclaiming that sins are taken away, that sin and death are defeated, that God has won and it wasn't close It wasn't a close call. It wasn't hanging in the balance and who is going to win out. In the end, God's power is so great. The power of life, the power of love, the power of Jesus Christ wins over all. It makes great stories. I agree with that. The whole idea that it's good and and evil and light and dark and it's this balance and this fight back and forth makes the best stories that we have. But never be in doubt about who's going to win. Never be in doubt about who's in charge. King of kings and Lord of lords, there is no one like him. Let's prepare our hearts to come to the feast. Will you please join me in prayer? Uh, Lord, the bread we're about to break and the cup we're about to bless don't look much like a feast. I mean, it's on fancy, uh, it's in, in, in fancy containers and all of that. But it's a tiny little, not even an appetizer, not even an hors d'oeuvre. Yet you say it is a foretaste of the wedding feast of the Lamb where we will be in your presence in perfect delight and joy, where you will gather your people safe from all harm, sin and death defeated forever, gates of heaven flung wide, and all life and all joy offered to us. For that, we are humbly thankful. Lord, prepare our hearts not only to come into your presence, but to come.